Welcome to worship here at North Congregational United Church of Christ. Um, it is so good to see all of you on this first Sunday of October. Where has this year gone? I mean, it, for me, literally, it feels like just yesterday it was the first of February, and now here we are in October. So I'm so grateful to see all of you who have come out this morning on this uh, rather dreary uh, Sunday, but it's still a great day anyway. Um, this is an important day in the life of our church for after our worship service this morning, we will be having a, a presentation slash meeting from the Settled Pastor Search Committee. So I invite you, I encourage you uh, to stay, to see uh, and listen to the work that they have done in order to help us transpose into the next season of our lives here. Um, I think that's it. So with that, let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. <laughs> Good morning. Please stand if you are able for the call to worship. We are created in relationship and for relationship. We are created for community. God knew it was not right for us to be alone. We are created for community. Through Jesus Christ, God entered into human relationship with us. We rejoice in our unity with all humanity. And please join me in the prayer of invocation. O oh, Redeemer God, as we gather in worship on this World Communion Sunday, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to fall afresh on us. We pray for your Spirit to awaken new hope in us. Grant us the vision to see the coming of your kingdom. Help us to celebrate the glimpses of grace that you have given to each of us. Knit our hearts together in worship and communion so that we know we do not struggle alone in working for your peace and justice. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let us continue with the prayer of confession. God made flesh, bone of our bone. We confess that we think we can go it alone, that we try to do it all, that in doing so, we neglect the gifts you have given us, the bone of our bone, the flesh of our flesh, the bodies you created, and the relationships you created us for. Jesus Christ, you who lived in a human body, calls us to community. Remind us that in you we are one. Awaken us a respect for one another and celebrate with us the diversity within that unity. 
May it be so now and forever. Amen. You are the divine creation, and it is not right for you to be alone. Know now that you are forgiven and called back into relationship with God and with one another. Please join me in the singing of our gathering hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, It Is In Your Bulletin. Let us sing together. In the spirit of love and the hope of unity, at this time, let us offer each other a sign of Christ's peace.
Good morning. So I'm going to take a little um, uh, lesson from Pastor Guy here. And because I was visiting this little guy this morning, um, I had to do my get ready for my story on the way. Good thing for talk to text. Um, so it's on here. So churches, you heard them talk a little bit about World Communion Day. So churches and congregations all over the world are celebrating communion today. Communion's when we share the bread and drink and remember how much Jesus loves us. And when we take communion, we take it in our hands. So we have all these different people all over the world connecting together and sharing communion in their hands. So I thought the perfect way to celebrate then was to read this book, We've Got the Whole World in Our Hands, and it's by Rafael Lopez. So you might know some of these words because it is a pretty good song too. We've Got the Whole World in Our Hands by Rafael Lopez. We've got the whole world in our hands. We've got the whole world in our hands. We've got you and you've got me in our hands. We've got the whole world in our hands. We've got the sun and the rain in our hands. We've got the moon and the stars in our hands. We've got the whole world in our hands. We've got the wind and the clouds in our hands. We've got the whole world in our hands. Look at all of those things in that picture. We've got the rivers and the mountains in our hands. We've got the oceans and the seas in our hands. We've got you and you've got me in our hands. We've got the whole world in our hands. We've got everybody here in our hands. All those hands. We've got the whole world in our hands. We've got everybody everywhere in our hands. I love it when the book turns this way. We've got the whole world in our hands. They put all of that string together, and they're flying away. We've got the whole world in our hands. So now, I wonder, because we're talking about World Communion Day, what kind of bread some of the other churches use. Right now, we have just a little cup and a little wafer on there. I wonder what kind of bread you like. I wonder if you know anybody else, maybe in your family, that's celebrating World Communion Day today. Well, you remember in the book, that little girl had a piece of yarn, and she had a ball of yarn, and she kept stringing it out and just stringing along everybody. So I have a ball of yarn for you to remember the story by. You can pick whichever color you want. And we're going to put our right hand and our left hand together. Right? Oops. Dear God, thank you for life-giving bread. Whole wheat, gluten-free, and matzah. Bless the bread all over the world today. And bless all the hands that hold it. Amen. All right, we're going to head off to Sunday Journeys. Hooray! <laughs> Hey. Uh -huh.
turn the hearts of the people to their God. The scripture reading today comes from Job chapter 1, beginning at first verse 1. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited against me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have, they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, he is in your power, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the soles of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a pot shared with him, which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as any foolish one would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. The second reading comes from Hebrews, the first chapter, beginning at the first verse. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by a son, whom God appointed heir of all things, through whom God also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjugation to them. But we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one God. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Our gospel this morning comes from the gospel as recorded by Mark, chapter 10. These are the words that are recorded. Some Pharisees came, and to test him, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, 
Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked, asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And his disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a child, as a little child, will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them and blessed them. My friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please rise as you are able in body or in spirit for our centering him. O oh, Master, let me walk with thee. Let us sing together. This morning, uh, we will begin a sermon series on the book of Job. For the f next four weeks, barring any world calamity, uh, we will examine this morality tale in depth and hopefully we can discover some things that we can all use in our everyday lives. Uh, one other thing, um, this morning's gospel reading um, was not uh, updated in any of the translations that I use for the Bible. So while it came off as very patriarchal, uh, let me state from the pulpit that uh, I believe that if you cheat on your spouse, no matter what your orientation, it's still adultery. Amen, amen. With that, please join me in a moment of prayer. 
Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for this time between pastor and people, between pulpit and pew. God, hide your servant in the shadow of the cross. Uh, give him a word for these, your assembled people, that is both receivable and believable. And God, I ask that you comfort the afflicted, but more importantly, afflict the comfortable. Uh, this I ask in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Uh, th this morning, as I do often, let me start off with a confession. I really don't like the dates between September 25th and October 21st. Uh, those 26 days have traditionally uh, been less than kind to me. Uh, without going into too many details, please know that both my parents died in the month of October, although not in the same year, thank goodness. On two separate occasions, I was uh, released from jobs during those 26 days, actually twice on the same day, a couple years apart, uh, one year I had a very bad car accident. I just don't like that time period. Just this year, um, September 26 was last week, and I've already had a debit card hacked, had to replace two tires, and on top of all of that, I have a sinus infection that has knocked me completely on my back. And in the midst of me trying to get rest from this demonic sinus infection, uh, in one day I get a telephone call that my godson's kidney disorder has flared up and he is now in the hospital. About an hour later, I get a call that a good friend has had a stroke and to put the proverbial cherry on top of the Sunday, uh, one of my musical sheroes died of COVID. And I am not the only one in history, it seems, who has received lots of distressing news at one time. Uh, my days this week and during the aforementioned time period are nothing compared to Job. Ah, uh, Job, the hero of undeserved suffering. Uh, Job, the one man who lives in community and still seems to be all alone. Uh, Job, uh, the man who, in a matter of speaking, sues God, takes God to court, and comes out with a hung jury. Some of you have never looked at it that way before. Uh, but today, we meet Job at the beginning of his tale, and the text as found in Job 1 tells us that Job was blameless, upright, feared God, and turned away from evil. And while the text does not say this explicitly, uh, Job is rich. Really rich. The text says he's the greatest person in all of the East, rich. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 of both yoke of oxen and donkeys and many servants. Uh, my friends, <laughs> Job is the man. He has a wife and 10 children, seven sons and three daughters. Uh, that's a theological joke right there. Y'all will figure it out later. Uh, but his wife really is the great one. She bore him 10 children. And Job prayed for those children and made sacrifices for them. Uh, remember the time in history where this story is set. Uh, he makes these sacrifices just in case they happen to sin and curse God in their heart. Job had the perfect life. He was blameless. 
He was upright. Job feared God and turned away from evil. Job had the perfect family. Job had enough resources, and he wanted for nothing. Now, what this morning's text does not tell you is that Job is about to have a bad day. A really bad day. In one day, Job has the equivalent of Black Monday and a couple of bad Fridays all at once. Job loses everything. Uh, Hasatan, the accuser, better known as Satan, appears with the heavenly beings, according to chapter 1, and uh, he tells God that Job will stop loving and trusting God if everything is taken away. You put a fence around him, Satan says, uh, and if you remove your protection from him, I guarantee you he will curse you to your face. Uh, God says, I don't think so, but let's make a deal. All that he has is in your power. However, you can't touch him. Satan replies, okay, goes off to go wherever he's going. Uh, just a side point, this really sounds like a movie from 1983 called Trading Places. Uh, those of you of a certain age know what I'm talking about. Those of you who don't, go rent it. Uh, but let me also take a pause here to let you know that even Satan answers to God and Satan does what God says. But back to the story. Satan gets to work immediately, and Job starts getting bad news. First, livestock looters take possession of the oxen and donkeys, ex and, and except for the one who comes back to tell Job what happens, kills all the servants. Next, a lightning strike kills all the sheep and the servants, except for the one who comes back to tell Job what happened. Uh, then camel carriers come off and steal them and kill all the servants, except for the one who comes back to tell him. And to add insult to injury, the one servant who survives comes and says, Mr. Job, um, I tell you and Mrs. Job this, but... Uh, your kids were having a party at your oldest son's house, and the house collapsed on them, killing everybody except me. Just a word of wisdom, be careful around people whose only job it is to bring you bad news. However, to be certain, Job has had a bad day. So now that we have arrived at chapter 2 and we're caught up once again, the heavenly beings present themselves before God, and who shows up again but Satan? God asked Satan once again, Satan, where you been? Satan said, to and fro, doing what I do. You know who I am. Uh, just being who I am. God says, you remember Job, right? The one you claim would curse me to my face if you lost everything? Well, God says, I let you bait me into letting you have at him, and even with everything you've done to him, he still is faithful. He upholds his integrity, and you incited me to let you hurt him. Satan has a good comeback argument, however. He says, God, people will do anything to save their lives, but if you reach out and touch his bone and flesh, I guarantee you he will curse you to your face. God again says, okay, but on one condition. You can't kill him. So Job has another bad day. Satan inflicts loathsome sores, the text tells us, from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. It really sounds like Job has shingles. And not only that, he can't get any comfort from his affliction, so he takes a piece of broken pottery to scrape himself. 
Uh, not only that, Mrs. Job has had enough according to the text. How long will you hold on to your integrity? Just go on and curse God and die. Yet another pause. Mrs. Job gets a bad rap here because I really believe that she is trying to help him ease his suffering. Because if we're honest, sometimes death is the merciful thing that needs to happen. Back to the story. Job admonishes her and says something that still resonates today. Uh, you sound foolish. Uh, how can we receive good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? And the text tells us that in spite of all of that, Job still did not sin with his lips. However, his heart and mind are not mentioned. So I have a question for you. How many of us have felt like Job? We've lost everything. And not only that, we're sick as well. Uh, how much more must we endure? How many of us have thought or said, God, enough is enough. I can't take anymore. Why is this happening to me? Why isn't this happening to somebody else who can handle it? God, I've been faithful. I've done everything right. I've served you, I've served your people, and still I have lost everything. How much more must I take? Remember I said Job was still faithful? You can still be faithful and ask God why this is happening. And you might not get an answer. My friends, Job does not admit to the reality of a satanic power, but suggests all things are in God's will. And on this day, no matter what is going on, this text affirms that despite his terrible suffering, Job does not abandon his deep trust in God. Can you take that stance that no matter what it is God's will, can you continue to be faithful to a God who doesn't seem to be faithful to you? Can you trust one that you cannot seem to hear or feel or see? Can you honestly be okay with a God who seems to be playing games with your very existence? I ask those questions all the time, especially between September 26th and October 21st. But can I tell you a secret? That's when I call on friends and family to help me through whatever I'm going through. That's when we learn to depend on our faith in the one that created us to help us through. That's when you and I depend on the community to sit with us until things get better. We are made to be in community and on bad days, and we will all have them. Make sure you reach out to those who will sit with you and hold your hand until things really do get better. Amen.
This morning in our prayers of the people, our first prayer request this morning comes from Ellen Baumgarten, who asks our creator to open the minds and hearts of all the world's leaders to the extreme crisis of global warming, so that they will take strong actions needed to save our precious home, Mother Earth. Bobby Moffitt has asked us to pray for a friend of hers named Robin. Um, she has had a bad medical diagnosis. Um, please pray for her, Robin's mother, Lucinda, who is um, having a rough time herself. And uh, prayers of healing for another friend named Diana and Diana's daughter, Bobby Jo. Um, Diana is in need of healing prayers, and both mother and daughter need prayers of comfort in the sudden death of Bobby Joe's daughter. Betty Foster asks that we give a prayer of thanksgiving for Betty, Betsy's mother's recovery, and prayers for God's will for health for Victor and Manuel. Manuel, I'm sorry. It snively asks that we pray for strength and comfort and improved health for Richard and to also pray for Richard's wife, Ursula. Um, please keep Phyllis Walker, the mother of Cherie Walker, uh, in our prayers um, as she has been transitioned into hospice care. Please keep Cherie in your prayers as well as she uh, helps to manage uh, the changes that are going on in their family. I ask that you uh, send a prayer of healing for my friend Gloria, who, like I said, had a stroke, uh, and for her extended family, who are her caretakers, uh, my godson Aaron, whose kidney problems have returned and he is still hospitalized. and. Uh, prayers of comfort, not only for the family, but for the entire entertainment uh, community for one Julia McGirt Nixon. Um, Julia is a lifelong friend of mine, and her claim to fame was uh, she replaced Jennifer Holliday on Broadway in Dreamgirls. So um, Julia died of COVID this week, so this is not only um, a, a sadness among friends, but just get the vaccine. Your response to God in, our, in your mercy will he, will, your response to God in your mercy will be, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. God, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. God, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others, and to your honor and glory. God, in your mercy, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them, Love one another as Christ loves us. God, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles. And bring them to the joy of your salvation. God, in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. God, in your mercy. 
God of all nations, we give you thanks that we are made in your image with such rich diversity. On this day, we are in solidarity with the faithful around the world. We remember that we are one body in you, even though we have different languages, cultures, and traditions, different ways of worship, praying, and praising. Your will is for your people to be one body. We are one body, but we are not the same. It is through the gift of diversity that we are able to be your body. Therefore, we thank you and praise you for making all of us who we are individually and collectively. We celebrate our own ancestry, culture, and ethnicity. And now we pray the prayer that our Savior taught his disciples, using the form that is most meaningful to you, saying together our parent, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please rise as you are able in body or spirit for our offering response. Praise God, the source of life and birth. Praise God, the word who came to work. Praise God, the spirit, holy flame. All glory, honor to God's name. Amen. Let us pray. For gifts given and received, O oh God, we offer thanks and praise. May we share our abundance with all who have need. May we share our hope in like measure. Amen. You may be seated. Luke the Evangelist wrote of our risen Savior, who at the table with two of the disciples took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were open and they recognized the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God Most High. God, our loving creator, close to us as breathing and distant as the farthest star. We thank you for your constant love for all you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life, for all people of faith in every generation who have given themselves to your will, and especially for Jesus Christ, whom you have sent from your own being as our Savior. We praise you for Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection, and for the calling forth of your church for its mission in the world. Gifted by the presence of your Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves to you as we unite our voices with the entire family of your faithful people everywhere, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy God, love. The whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna in the highest. Uh, merciful God, as siblings in faith, we recall anew these words and acts of Jesus Christ. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it. Gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. Jesus took a cup and after giving thanks, gave it to the disciples and said, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out 
for many for the forgiveness of sins. We remember Christ's promise not to drink of the fruit of the vine again until the heavenly banquet at the close of history, and we say boldly what we believe. Christ has died. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at this table that our eyes may be opened and we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst, in each other, and in all for whom Christ died. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life Christ gives us. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is offered for us. Let us eat together. Let us drink together. This time let us sing our communion hymn, Eat of This Bread. Let us pray. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. This time I invite our moderator, Diane Farabi, to come with this morning's moderator message. Good morning. So good to see all of you this morning. We do have a few announcements. There are still a few spaces in the getting, for the getting to know you small group sessions. Um, October 10th and October 24th sessions. Join us for pizza and sharing. If you haven't signed up, you can still do that. Um, I think uh, you might just want to talk to Joyce about that. Today we do invite, as Pastor Guy said, invite you to stay immediately following worship for the Settled Pastor Search Committee report that's going to be given by the chair, Jay Hitsey. Touchpoint Thursday has started and is taking place virtually at 7 p.m. Looking through the lens of forgiveness, Pastor Guy is taking participants through the book, The Scandal of Forgiveness, Grace Put to the Test by Philip Yancey. Um, Pastor Guy will read excerpts from each chapter and lead discussion. David Miyashiro is the Zoom moderator. For the Zoom link, check the internal Facebook page and Flutnet. Virtual Reb <laughs> Webs resumed on Wednesday, September 29th from 7 to 8.30 and will continue on Wednesdays from 7 to 8.30 with Joanne Nay as facilitator. Thank you, Joanne. The book See No Stranger, a memoir of and manifesto of revolutionary love by Valerie Kaur will be discussed. 
and the whole series is a 10-week series. Susan Yetzi is the Zoom moderator, and again, look for the Zoom link and reading assignments, and um, that's all. Also, from Christian Education, you may have noticed that, <clears throat> pardon me, the Board of Christian Education has set up a poster board out in the lobby, and um, it is to highlight the children and youth of our congregation so that we can get to know them all a little bit better. We invite all families with children and youth to send photos and a little bit of information to Sarah Pastori. Um, include the photos, their ages, their grade levels, um, their interests, any hobbies, and um, we, we'd like to see all of those pictures out on the board. So um, if you're a family who with children or know a family in the church, ask them to do that. And if you have any questions, um, see Sarah. Uh, also send this information to Sarah. I don't think I mentioned that. The last of our produce market Saturdays will take place this coming Saturday, rain or shine. And as you know, Pastor Joanna has been the key leader for our church's participation. In her absence, I'm happy to let you know that plans are being made for transitional leadership so that we may continue this very important part of what we do um, as we collaborate with the Wesley Church of Hope. Um, check the website for the website calendar for more information, or you can contact Tim Delameter and hope to, I hope to see many of you there. The usual weekly reminders still hold. Check your pew pads if you haven't already filled them out. Send them back to the center and check around you for whatever you've brought in and gather it up to take it with you when you leave. I hope that each day you take time to center and find your peaceful place and strive to be gentle with yourself and be of good heart. Thank you. At this time, please rise as you are able in body or in spirit for our sending him. What a friend we have in Jesus. Let us sing this great hymn of the church together.
to the only wise God, our Savior, be all glory and honor, majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Friends, our celebration has ended, but our service, not just to each other in these four walls, but to the entire world. Let us go forth in the power of the Spirit to love and serve the Lord, but more importantly, to change the world.